it's gone from, eh, why bother caring about it to like, yeah, well, we're all gonna die. And welcome to another episode of No Books on a Dead Planet. I am somebody who is incredibly terrified about the ending of the world, but can't actually intellectually engage with it on any level because it scares me too much. But I love books so much that when I think about the fact that books might not exist on the planet, somehow that gets into my brain. So I have this series um, where um, I'm inviting a guest on um, every episode to read with me uh, a book that you might be scared to read about the climate crisis and have a conversation that you might be scared to have about the climate crisis. So this is here. You, if you're lazy, you are welcome here. We're going to read the book for you, have the conversation for you in the hopes that you might pick up the book, have the conversation, or at least come away with some of the learning points um, from the book that we're going to read. Today, I'm really, really excited because uh, we have a guest on that I have watched for years. Watched for years. Um, Levi is here. He is of the channel Levi and Leah and also Future Proof. Hello, Levi. Aw, Lena, thanks for <laughs> having me. Uh, also, over here. a fellow uh, long-time watcher. So thanks for having me. There we go. I'm excited. The worlds converge. Um, so Levi is on the other side of the planet-ish. Well, I don't know. I've got, I've got a third across the planet, maybe. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for getting up so early, Levi. Can you tell us just, uh, like, if somebody hasn't seen your channel before, one, rude. Uh, <laughs> but if they haven't, can you just tell us, like, a little whistle-stop tour of what, what you do and, and what you do existing? I don't know. <laughs> What is your existence like? <laughs> that's, that's, what is my existence? My goodness, starting off light. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so my wife Leah and I have a, a channel called Levi and Leah where we basically capture our lifestyle and uh, what we do in our life on a day-to-day -day basis, but also through the lens of sustainability, how we, um, you know, live a sustainable lifestyle is still awesome, you know, so we're not like living under a rock and, you know, making our own milk with a, you know, poundy piece of wood thingy like it's back in whatever 1800s yeah. or something um yeah and then i launched future proof back in november which is sort of a, an explainer channel where we talk about different brands and companies that are trying to make the world a better place or the ones that are not also <laughs> sometimes the bad ones <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i love it and i think what i really like about um your and leah's kind of um way of living i think lifestyle is like lifestyle um it's just you yeah exactly you make it look e like not easy but fun and and doable like you you're not mm. you're not you don't make it like intimidating or anything and like you said you're not like cleaning your teeth with sticks and <laughs> going proper back to basics <laughs> It exactly. still looks like a recognisable life, so it's really, really cool. Um, before we chat about the book that we're going to chat about today, um, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about how you find, because obviously you talk about um, the environment and the, the big CC, the climate crisis, uh, all the time on the internet, but in your real, real life, not that there is really, I mean, what is the differentiation? But in, in your life off screen, how do you find like having conversations about the climate crisis and do you find them hard? Have you found them easier over the years or how does that go for you well it's it's changed a little bit from um something that people were sort of skeptical about or or like maybe hesitant to get into uh, to now something that's sort of accepted um as sort of like an apathetic end of day scenario that is inevitably going to come like mm -hmm. now even people who don't care about climate change acknowledge that it exists because uh, you know, we're probably all going to die in a fiery inferno or under, you know, seawater rise or something. You know, like <laughs> it's it's gone from, eh, why bother caring about it to like, yeah, well, we're all going to die. So it's it's like <laughs> no more cheerful. <laughs> yeah, it's not better from like a psychological standpoint, but at least we're not uh, denying it anymore. Yeah, there's at least an opportunity to crank open the tin and be like, maybe we can talk about it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I think I think you're right. I think a lot of my like um uh like kind of conversations have changed just because the environment around us has changed and like the media mm. environment it has actually become a little bit more more normal to talk about it. And when I gave up meat, I thought everybody would have loads of questions about it and nobody had any questions for me. <laughs> Which yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> "Excuse me, I have a lot of answers prepared about why I've given up meat, but it was more normal and nobody was interested." <laughs> so Which is a good yeah. thing, hopefully, you know, Ex like that's Exactly. I was hoping yeah. for some kudos or to be like the radical, but, but no. Exactly. As usual, I'm doing something incredibly normal and boring. On to 
<laughs> um, the book that we chose today, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, is one book that I have heard quite a lot about and have never mm-hmm. picked up for no particular reason. Um, but when we were chatting about you coming on the series, you picked this book from my suggested list. Can you I tell did. me why and if you'd heard about it before? I had heard about it from almost every member of my family. Oh, wow. This was, this is my, my, I, I come from a family of readers. Um, mm-hmm. So my mom and my uncle and my grandmother and my grandfather and my dad and all that side of, of my family is, is really into reading and um, not like low brow smut. Like they're into like <laughs> real, like Canada reads uh, high level intellectual yeah. books about, you know, like current events and and like you know immigrant stories and and things that like you know really force you to think a little bit and so this was one on that list and I was like I don't want to go there <laughs> that's <laughs> that that sounds like a lot of work um mm. and uh and so this was this was like a challenge for me I was like all right I know I know that this is one that I should read it's been on the list for a while let's get into it nothing more inspiring than a deadline <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Sadly, <laughs> that's yes. my muse. My muse is a deadline. Um, well, yeah, I think also because um, uh, Robin, who wrote the book, is a, like an academic and a professor. There's the, that definitely comes through in the writing, so I can understand why it's a bit like, oh god, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you should have wished your family were into bodice rippers and stuff, and they'd be recommending you fun stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> but at least now, when you see them, you can be like, I've actually read it. I have notes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I will. I will have regained regained some status yeah. amongst the family. Did you have any um, preconceptions about what the book might be like, apart from the fact that it might be a bit hard? Because I think for me, like I kind of thought it would be more of a kind of manifesto, and I felt for the first kind of half half it was more of like amusing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She was kind of musing on what she was experiencing and what she believed, but it did definitely go a bit manifesto at the end. So I I enjoyed that. But um, was there yeah. any misconceptions you had about it, and you're surprised by? Uh, I thought it was going to be far less readable. I, mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be far more jargonous and um, doomsday kind of epic in 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 the the sort of language that I have heard um, a lot of these books take place. She actually did a remarkable job of uh, weaving in some humanity that wasn't depressing and yeah. uh, making a compelling story that that I found interesting throughout the the information that is so necessary. Yeah, so. definitely. Um, the subtitle I forgot to say is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants. And I, what well, I think you're right, I think she kind of takes you along, like models her life. She's like, I live alongside plants and this is how my day goes. And this is how I've cleared a pond. And this is, you know, so I think it's, it's kind of like your channel, I guess it's like bringing people along and being like, this is what I'm doing um, mm-hmm. and, and making it not so intimidating. I realized as well, like something that I wasn't expecting was the listing on my copy, like in the Dewey Decimal System is botany. And I honestly don't think I've ever read a book <laughs> that was in the botany wow. section. <laughs> Wow. And I was like, I think this is, and I think that's why, like, there was parts of it that I was like, I've never read a book like this before, but that's probably because it's about the science of plants, and that's not something I've really foraged into, as it were. Um, yeah, she, she made a good point in there, because she kind of reflects on, on her role as an ecologist, as a, a mm. I guess she's an ecologist, not a biologist, those are different things. Um, but that specific focus on plants and like she talks about her indoctrination into like Western medicine and how that really shaped her worldview and how she had to like unlearn that side of this conversation to kind of like relearn her traditional knowledge and like trying to merge those two and and the difficulties between that. Um, That's where I found it got interesting. Like, because honestly for me, when she started like, talking about the different kinds of plants and stuff. I was like, okay, like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> am I gonna like go and Google every single one of these plants to see what they look like, to understand yeah. like what it might look like in my brain to imagine these things? And that's, that's, I think, what so many people get wrong with climate change related books is that they get far too concerned about the literal statistics or the yeah. facts or the truth, you know? There's so much that needs to be said, it feels like. There's so much terrible stuff, and if only people knew. But the thing is, is that we all know 
the, the thing is we need to invoke people's emotions and get them to feel like they can act. And uh, I, I felt like she charted her journey to action well enough and in an interesting way that, uh, you know, maybe maybe more people will act once they read this book. Yeah, definitely. And I think also, like, there was a part, when I was making notes about what I might say, like, there was part of me was like, oh, some of these descriptions, especially of the plants, I was like, bit long, of it, like, not really. I am a plant yeah. person in, a, in practice, I guess, I'm going to have to be, but I'm not really, like, my housemate at uni did a, a dissertation on soil, and I can't, I can't say that I've ever connected with a person less on that level. <laughs> like, there's so much about it that I was like, I don't, and again, like, I think I would have benefited, I'd love for this to come out in an illustrated edition, like, if they had a picture, mm. of, like, the, she's got really great, like, like, visceral yes. descriptions of them, but because, and again, because, like, the, um, like, uh, Americas aren't my native land I don't I can't there's no way I would have ever seen these plants before so that would have been useful but it was funny because I was thinking like oh some parts of this are quite long like there's a whole chapter where she just like talks about how she clears her pond <laughs> yep. and she was really cares about clearing her pond but um yeah. then she kind of called me out on page 110 because she talks about this part where um she's doing the Thanksgiving address and she does it with like business people and people from the government and they kind of comment on like how long it is and like mm -hmm. how it's like she, like why are they just des des describing everything they're grateful for in this address like can we just get on with the meeting yeah and she's she said she said poor you I sympathize what a pity that we have so much to be thankful for <laughs> and I was like <laughs> Boom. I was like, I, I have Devastated. been owned by you, Robin, because I was getting, because I think maybe, maybe I'm just a millennial and I've got a short attention span, but I was getting a bit like, oh, I don't want to hear about every, like every species in your pond, but she's thankful for it. And I should, again, I have been indoctrinated into a Western way of thinking where I mm -hmm. just switch off. So yeah, I thought that was quite funny. I had a little laugh because I was like, oh, she's talking to me. <laughs> it's, it, it, she, she does have a very, um, good way of of illustrating those kinds of relationships and that dichotomy between the two polarized cultures um, that she occupies it's it's fantastic especially as somebody who kind of grew up in canada where we have a lot of indigenous culture and a lot of re indigenous uh, resurgence that's happening right now it's you see the two butting heads quite often and uh, yeah. she captured that beautifully yeah. And I mean, on that note, actually, I was going to ask you, so I, I was trying to think of like in my twenties and my thirties, I definitely like engaged more with like understanding like the indigenous culture, particularly in America. Uh, but I, or the Americas, I don't know how to say that <laughs> without being like, cause I know that yeah. people are from Canada hate saying like when I say American, I don't, I mean USA, which is bad, but like the America, anyway, <laughs> that's my, own, that's my own path to walk, <laughs> to work out. There you but go. Where, um, I was thinking about like in my childhood, any time that I had interacted with any media that discussed like Native American stuff. And it was mm -hmm. only this really awful film, I don't know if you've seen it, called Indian in the Cupboard. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty bad. Uh, Pocahontas. And then also whenever I went on a trip to Cadbury's World, which is a chocolate factory that I used to go on as a kid that you get like school trips. And they have like a whole section where they explain like the origins of cocoa and they have like, full grown uh, full grown like wax models of native americans like handing you cocoa beans it's incredibly creepy so that's amazing as, as somebody who grew up in britain like they're like we, it's not something that we learn about at all in the school system so i'd, I'd love to hear like what you learned growing up about it and if that's mm. kind of changed and stuff well we didn't learn a lot um, it was it was so i i'm a part of a generation that uh lived pre and post internet and i am part of a generation that lived pre and post indigenous really um my community where i grew up uh was a rural small town in the more northern part of the province that we live in and uh to this day the local indigenous people are referred to as indians and they live really? on an, an indian reservation and uh, there's still a lot of, of pretty blatant racism towards them. And uh, it was just like a completely undiscussed part of, of my childhood. It wasn't like we, we gave them rides. Uh, there was uh, members of our community that we knew personally that we talked with and hung out with. There was never a discussion of like, <laughs> you know, Tom is 
indigenous. There was yeah. never like it was not a thing we talked about. No. Um, and and those there, but but the the segregation was really real. There was um, an Indian in quotation marks side of the school, so the, only the the indigenous kids would be on that side of the school, and all the white kids would be on the other side. What? Um, what yeah. Did you, did you learn different things? No, no. It, it, well, yeah, actually, in, in some ways. Um, it wasn't formal segregation. It wow. was just like social that. segregation. So they just kind of found themselves in, in that corner, probably because of racism and, and social exclusion and the way that our system was set up. And like I'm reflecting on this as I speak to you and I'm like, yeah, that was... Yeah, that was kind of crazy. Like, how, how did that even happen? Um, and then I went to university and uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, released findings and um, discussed the, the realities of uh, residential schools in Canada, which was uh, sort of like a cultural genocide that happened, um, sadly, not that long ago. And uh, this was basically like taking kids and indigenous people off the land and then basically taking the Indian out of the boy or whatever that famous quote is. And uh, that was the first time I heard about it when I was in university wow. in, in the country that about it happened About the same time in. as me. Then. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and I think that that just goes to, to show how incredibly um, pervasive and, and uh, well done that uh, genocide was. Like the fact that people who lived and were born just shortly after the last residential school closed in this country had literally no idea that happened or mm -hmm. that it was important. Um, and actually one thing I wanted to do when we started this is uh, a land acknowledgement, which is oh, something yes. that um, I'm trying to do more and that I not totally comfortable with, but I think it's important to try. Um, so where I am right now, I'm on the uh, traditional territories of the Lekwungen, the Wasanich, the Esquimalt, and the Songhees Nation. Uh, these are a sort of patchwork of different ancestral tribes that have lived in this area for millennia. And uh, this is where our university is. This is where our parliament is. This is where I live and it's where a lot of my friends live and all of these communities were once what made this place up and now we are all settlers here and we benefit greatly from this privilege. So I am thankful every day for the place that I live and uh, I acknowledge that one day a while ago was not ours and we took it. And so, uh, yeah, feeling yeah. appreciative. It has has that become more of a like kind of um, normal thing for people to start doing because I've got a few emails from Canadian publishers actually who it's like it's in their their footnotes mm -hmm. of their emails and stuff is that something that's more recent that's come into yeah it's it's becoming in certain parts so uh, Canada is extremely large and uh, the varying political spectrum is as large so we are on the west coast which is far more liberal leaning and uh, has a much more vibrant and um, frankly uh, economically powerful indigenous community here so we like the university has uh, an official statement and has like mandated curriculum that every single class at UVic has to incorporate some sort of acknowledgement of indigenous right. ancestry and so like half of my classes in geography were yeah. if not entirely focused majoritively focused on the realities of residential schools and the histories that wow. occupied this land before we were here. So there is a lot of emphasis where we live. You go over the Rocky Mountains into the prairies mm -hmm. and the acknowledgement is not quite so robust. So there's a um, bit of time I, travel I, over the yeah, Rockies into the 40s. <laughs> Yeah, there there is uh, varying levels of, of uh, sort of interest in this as as a topic, as a point of conversation, and as a way moving forward um, for us, I think. And uh, reading this book was very interesting because it's set in the U.S. where yeah. they are like way behind Canada in terms of acknowledging that, you know, these are people who lived here for a long time and actually know what they're talking about. So... Um, yeah, it's it's interesting to read her reflections because in some ways I'm like, yeah, I, 
we know. Don't we know? Do we know this? Do we know? I thought we knew this. <laughs> like, we've been talking about this for like 10 years now. Like, is this not what we're all on the same page? No? Okay. All right. Write yeah. the book. Definitely. Well, that's the thing, I guess, like, if your whole family are recommending this, like, you're on the, you know, they're the people yeah. that obviously kind of understand it a little bit more and it's something that I mean when you're saying that it kind of reminds me of like in the UK I'm from a, a city called Coventry which is the most bombed um city apart from London when the World War II happened so we had a partner German school we had to learn German from a young age like we had like all of this like reverse indoctrination to be like German people are nice <laughs> was basically the whole <laughs> premise wow. of it <laughs> so it reminds me of that a little bit so in my very uh nerdy bookish book club kind of way I set us some little tasks and one of them was to pick a quote or a point um that stood out to you do you want to go first or shall I I feel like I'm reading, like sharing some kind of Bible thing where I'm like, Levi, would you like to share with the class <laughs> your reflections on John verse two, chapter Here eight. Here are my insights. <laughs> Let me bestow my knowledge yeah, upon you. Me. My I'm opinion ready. as a white man is very valuable. Hmm. Um, <laughs> That's why don't going you... in the excerpt, just that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> exactly. Uh, why don't you go first? Okay, so... um. On page 29, apparently there was something that hit us very early on in the book. Oh yeah, so this is really interesting. So she's talking about marketplaces and this idea, she had this dream about this market where you didn't pay for anything, but because mm. you didn't pay for anything, you weren't that tempted to take things. And this yeah. idea of when something is cheap, you want a lot of it. So she said, um, had all the things in the market merely been a very low price, I probably would have scooped up as much as I could. But then when everything becomes a gift, I felt that self-restraint. And I think that's something that I really identify with, like the difference between me going into somewhere where everything's on bulk sale versus me at like maybe Christmas dinner and there's like four roast potatoes left. And I'm like, oh no, I couldn't, you have some. And you, mm -hmm. you, because you look eye to eye with the people that you're sharing with, you're much more likely to be like, oh no, I actually don't need it, it's fine. You know, Where, versus like the kind of greedy side of it. That was and one was... of my favorites too. I actually had that on here. Oh really? Great yeah. minds. Um, and then also this idea on page 116 about patriotism and how mm. there is a kind of, uh, yeah, she says, she's talking about the Pledge of Allegiance versus the Thanksgiving address. And she says, I love my country too and its hopes for freedom and justice, but the boundaries of what I honor are bigger than the Republic. Let us pledge reciprocity with the living world. What if we want for our people, what if what we want for our people is patriotism? Then let us inspire true love of the country by invoking the, the land herself. So I like that idea that I feel like sometimes discussions of patriotism divide the left and the right and like right wing people tend to be patriotic and left wing people don't as much or at least more suspicious yeah. of that as a concept. Whereas she's kind of reckon like hoping in the future to reconcile that and be like, to be patriotic is to care about the land. Like it's, it can mm -hmm. be, and those kind of like overlaps give me a bit of hope because sometimes I feel like <sighs> the way people think feels so far apart. Just like, I mean, you've got, a, sounds like you've got a physical divide of the, of the mountains <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> like I quite like that as like a visual thing, but like that divide between like the people who are patriotic and the people who aren't, I feel like maybe me trying to reframe stuff as like me caring about the environment as a pa patriotic act, as something that isn't in con isn't a contradiction to what the other people who I'm mainly against their beliefs are trying to do, you know? I like this section because it, it, it's uh, something we learned about in my geography degree, uh, which is called the tragedy of the commons. Mm. It's a very well-known concept, basically. It's uh, all of the, the, the free things that we have in the world, which is like the air, the water, the trees, the rocks, and, and the fish in the ocean. All, all of these things are the commons, and they're mm. common because everybody has access to them, and therefore they are technically free. Um, but the problem with the tragedy of the commons is that there is no incentive to not take as much as you possibly can. Because mm. if you don't take the fish that is there, somebody else will just take the fish. Um, so, you know, there's, there's this kind of very uh, destructive loop that happens with uh, so much of the, the modern capitalist economy that just kind of drives people to want and have and possess as much as they possibly can. And uh, this was like an articulation of that, as you said, that kind of like undercut it as, as like, hmm, maybe we can all 
think about these things, but think about them in just like a slightly different way to make it positive overall. And I, this is what I think about a lot when I hear about um, a lot of uh, Christian and other religious communities that have taken environmental points of view with their mm -hmm. religion. So they now interpret God's word or, or whatever uh, religion they're a part of as calling them to uh, preserve and love and cherish the beautiful world that they are a part of. And their yeah. acts of service to that God are actually to clean up a marsh or advocate for, you know, some kind of environmental preservation. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is kind of how we get out of this if we do it's it's not going to be like okay let's all just stop eating cheetos <laughs> it has to be something more romantic than that and something more wholehearted and, and uh, visceral which i i think indigenous cultures have a pretty good tap into yeah it's got to be fun <laughs> It can't be like no fun allowed, no Cheetos for you. Like it's gonna, yeah. you've got to give something, somebody, it's like something else to replace the Cheetos with. <laughs> exactly, and and I think we all long for that thing. Uh, yeah. You know, what's the opposite of a Cheeto if not a spiritual connection to the land? Mm. <laughs> you know, totally. we we all want meaning, we all want significance, we all want to feel like we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. That's why we all are drawn to, to religion. And I think what she says in this book so often is that like, the, the bigger thing is the planet. The bigger mm -hmm. thing is, is the natural world and, and you're all just not listening. You know, yeah. it's there. If you want it, it's there. You just have to acknowledge that it's there and, and uh, recognize it for the beauty that it is. Yeah, totally. And I think as well, like when you've been speaking, it's, it's true that I think that in a lot of religions and cultures, this kind of idea of sharing resurfaces all the time throughout history. Like we do keep returning to it. It's not yeah. this weird concept that we've never achieved before. Is it? And I think, oh, I mean, fun fact, my parents are um, Christian and they lived under Common Purse for like a long, long time, like all, like even up until when I was like five, which Common wow. Purse, if you're not in like Christian circles, means that you either give away all of your income <laughs> to the church and then you just get given what you need or you work for free and then the church provide a house for you and stuff and that's like something wow. that within my lifetime like that's how I grew up in the beginning makes it sound I wasn't in a cult I just need to be it needs to be clear <laughs> wasn't quite a cult but that kind of idea of common person sharing is something that you can come across in loads of different ways and I remember like when I was growing up, like I, I remember seeing my mum reading like her, the water bill and I was like, sorry, excuse me, do we have to pay for water? <laughs> and I remember being really like <laughs> indignant wow. that we had to pay for water because I didn't think that that would, I just thought you could turn on the tap. And I remember being right. like, talking to my mum being like, but if we don't have water, we'll die. And she's like, yes. And I'm like, so we have to pay for it. And she's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, and that's capitalism. <laughs> that was the um, beginning of the of the end of optimistic Lena. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, so mm. the, this religious shared purse is that what it's called? Common purse. Common it's purse. Like, it's, there's people use different terms for it, but just means I mean, sharing. <laughs> it's it's essentially the same idea, though. Like yeah. it's it's a perhaps a, a slightly less sophisticated. Um, less environmentally focused version of, of what she talks about this. Like she, she has this uh, line, uh, she says, in Western thinking, private land is understood to be a bundle of rights, whereas mm. in a gift economy, property is a bundle of responsibilities. Mm. And I, I think that what you described is like, okay, the difference is, hey, I'm, I'm doing my thing. This is, this is my thing. And I get to do what I want to do with it because I pay for it versus like, yeah, hey, sucks. we're all doing this thing. <laughs> Let's let's just make sure that it's good for our kids down the road. Mm. You know, that and I responsibility. Guess that, that extends to like intellectual property as well. Because if you've got intellectual property, what's your responsibility? Once you have those facts, like like the guy who didn't patent penicillin because he was like, mm, seems that humans need penicillin, so I'm yeah. not going to patent it. Um, oh. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Um, I also set us to have a factoid. Do you have a factoid? at all there was actually i think there's less emphasis on fact like mm -hmm. on quotable numbers rather yeah. than facts in the book which so i was, loved yeah I, I, I think quotable numbers are exhausting um mm. and and i i have found that when you're arguing with your in-laws or uh old high school friends facts never win arguments mm. there, there's there's never been a moment where somebody says but you know what the 
particulate matter in the ozone layer is now 350 parts per million. And they were like, <laughs> cool. got it. I'm, I'm on board now. We're going to fight climate change. Um, but it's those, it's those emotional, uh, personal things that, that are uh, what bring people together. It's those connections of like, well, why are you scared? Hmm. What about this makes you angry? What are these kind of fundamental core feelings that you have and, and why are those things coming up? That's the, the stuff that makes people change or think even. Totally. And also the kind of just thing of like, what what would it take for you to believe it? Like, what fact do you need to hear? <laughs> yeah, you know? are, are like, there any? Are there any? Is there yeah. a graph? Well, yeah, yeah, but there's no graphs in this book. We can, we can you know, reassure you of that. Not a graph, yeah. but a concept that I, mm -hmm. that I enjoyed tremendously because I feel like it articulated something juicy uh, is uh, the Windigo concept, the Windigo monster, which is <gasps> yes. the, mm -hmm. it's, it's this mythological monster of some sort that uh, embodies greed, essentially. And this is sort of a, a tale. Um, maybe it sounds condescending to call it a tale, but it's uh, it's a story that is shared within um, the, the the communities that she's a part of that uh, eats everything um, and consumes far more than it needs to. And it's uh, in in her collective culture, in her in her communal space, the the person who eats the most is banished, essentially. Or they're punished in a variety of ways and uh, she talks about how you know there's stories of people hunting down the wendigo monster to to try and get rid of it and this was like this terrible thing like if you were greedy and you consumed a whole bunch you were like the epitome of the worst um mm. but in western consumer culture the wendigo greed monster is the most celebrated form of humanity and it's like, we're taught to not be scared of that. Whereas they're like, what's the scariest thing you could be? And it's like, insatiably hungry. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, it's, it's a, when she pointed that out, it was like, oh man, this, mm. is, this is just such a huge detraction from what we're, what we're supposed to be doing, which is, you know, like communing, uh, you know, supporting each other and, and celebrating what we all have and, we, we've just collectively as a culture devolved into to greed. Just greed is like the sole purpose of, of our collective existence, it seems at this point. And, uh, and as she says, she's like, well, we, we will be punished. The yeah. earth will eventually, uh, you know, rebalance itself, um, mm. but it just won't have humans in it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Which is kind of uplifting and scary at the same time. It's like when we say like we're saving the planet, I'm like, well, we're actually kind of saving ourselves. Which, yeah, exactly. If we are motivated by selfish means, means it should be even more possible. <laughs> I feel like both exactly. ways yes. prove it. I'm like, if we're, if we're inherently selfish beings, then we've got this. <laughs> yeah, we've um, got it. Oh yeah, so um, the, the kind of fact that I like was she, uh, she talks about like relearning her native language and stuff and how hard she's finding it and how mm. frustrating um and she realizes that to, to actually speak of course requires verbs and here is where my kindergarten proficiency at naming things leaves off english is a noun based language somehow appropriate to a culture who is obsessed with things the burns the burns Robin. yes yes um only 30 percent of english words are verbs but in potter sorry i'm gonna but potter toi me potter toi me maybe apologies if not um that that proportion is 70 percent which means that 70 percent of the words um that have to be conjugated 70 percent have different tenses and and cases to be mastered so 30 wow. percent versus 70 i'm like frick and it is a, it is a fault failure of language i think as well like yeah. how we talk about things and how we you know how we call it saving the planet <laughs> or like the cl climate change versus climate crisis that it's all um I think language can help or hinder us, depending. Yeah, we, we've done a remarkable job of spinning the web tighter and mm. tighter around ourselves while trying to get out of it. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very <laughs> remarkable performance we've put on that, uh, you know, I think she, she does a, a great job of sort of illustrating how these things can be remedied. Um, because as she sort of talks about later in, in the book, um, about how like 
you know, uh, natural disasters and pollution are being kind of remediated by collective actions between people and natural things, uh, plants and, and the environment in general. Um, she she talked about <laughs> the three sisters. Did you see uh, that section? Yeah, yeah. A fantastic example of like, <laughs> there is nature in its beauty without humans and it operates in its own perfect harmony. Uh, and then there's humans, which is like a ultimately disastrous variable that usually just destroys everything. But there is a way for us to kind of merge and and create this sort of new dynamic. And so what the three sisters is, um, is corn, uh, beans, and squash that are all planted in the same mound of soil and I'm explaining for you, not for Lena. Cool. Um, I the corn, the corn stalk grows first, and uh, it sprouts up and starts growing really quickly. And then shortly after that, the bean grows. But the green bean needs something to latch onto. It needs some sort of supportive stalk, and so it crawls up the corn. But it doesn't crawl up fast enough to stop or hinder the growth of the corn itself. So the corn still has its full maturity. The beans are able to wrap up beside it, and then we have the squash which is the third sister, which crawls out along the ground and shades the soil and retains moisture, but also fixes nitrogen as well. So the three of them sort of like dance and live together in this uh, symbiotic relationship. And I'm like, yay, nature. Yes. Yeah. Way to go. It's incredible that we think it's more efficient to separate all of the seeds and then harvest them all separately. Well, I'm like, we literally already have the most efficient thing possible. Like why, what? Yeah. <laughs> Classic yeah. humans making problems that aren't there. Um, my my one of my other questions is: Would you recommend this book to people? And if you would, would you recommend it to specific people at specific points in their climate change journey, <laughs> or mm. whatever that is? Or would it be like a universal, like everybody should read this right now? Because I think both are both are complementary answers to the book. Both like, hmm. yeah, both are nice things to say. I like those disclaimers because I don't think that every climate change book is for everyone. Um, I would say that on the spectrum of like doom and gloom, this is definitely a little below middle in terms of fear mongering. It, it, it is very frank and honest about the challenges. It is very uh, depressing in the way that she can illustrate how brutally we have mangled some of the natural areas that we occupy. But she does a really great job of illustrating that this is not the way that it needs to be and that there are other ways of going about this. Um, I would say I would recommend this to someone who is well aware of the situation but is um, rather exhausted by the facts and figures. Mm. This, this is a great yeah. book for somebody who's kind of done mm. but needs a different perspective. Because I, I yeah. think especially for, for me as, as a student who went to university to study climate change and talk about why this is important, the indigenous perspective is incredibly positive. If you talk to elders, if you uh, read this book, you really hear um, something that you don't hear in a lot of climate conversations, which is love and, yeah, and appreciation. Um, there's so much positivity that comes through uh for her and and i would imagine her community when they talk about this subject matter that it, it can be really uplifting and it makes you feel positive uh mm -hmm. for a change and not in like a we can do this if we just invent a new windmill that somehow floats above the stratosphere you know like it, it's like you, it, for once elon musk isn't solving the problem and that's great you know, um, yeah. because it feels more human and it feels more day to day. And uh, yeah, so middle of the road climate journey, probably a nice little boost in the middle there. <laughs> yeah, give you a little lift. Uh, you're, what you're saying reminds me of I've just rewatched Wally. -E. Have you like have you seen that film? Yeah. Well, I hadn't seen it since it came out, which was probably like 15, 10 years ago. And um, the whole concept is I'd forgotten. Uh, we fuck up planet Earth. So we go on a spaceship and we stay there for 700 years until the world regenerates and then we come back down. And I was literally thinking like, did Elon Musk watch Wally -E and take it as fact? <laughs> like, was he like, Honestly, great idea, I'm going to run with it. <laughs> it's, it, it, it now we're like, you know what? 
if we can live 700 years, it might not be a bad idea. <laughs> I could live 700 years. We already know how to mess it up when we come back. Like, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I think I'd agree. I think it's for somebody it, like this. It's for somebody who's like the climate crisis isn't news to them because I think this would mm -hmm. be a a a rude awakening that might scare you off. Um, but I think it's it's really important. And also, just some if you like nature writing and you like imagining that you live in the countryside and like the visceral descriptions of everything, like people who are really into that, I think that like would really really enjoy it. And uh, mm. also like that if people have read too many white men books with graphs, <laughs> then I think you're right. It's yes. a good respite. It's like I still want to carry on on this motorway, but I'm gonna need to like. <laughs> change my yeah. tactic then i think it's it's perfect to like complete that kind of education um yeah. i final thoughts do you have any like anything that you feel like you're gonna step away from this book and like do anything or do you think there's any key learnings that will stick with you you're going to change your way you think or is that something that will only come later months and months in the future we won't know it, it has sadly it has really made me question where i want to live um okay because what she talks about is so um, grounded in nature. And, and I think that there's a, a great appreciation that you can have when you live in an apartment like I do, um, you know, many feet off the ground, you know, with trees in the distance. Uh, but this sort of makes you wonder if there isn't a, a separation happening that makes it difficult to ever truly appreciate and, and uh, value the natural world in the way that we kind of need to because mm -hmm. um how do you respect and appreciate the water that you get every day if you don't uh see the spring that it comes from or yeah. you know witness the the tragedy of of a logging block near where you live you know to truly respect and appreciate the trees that are in your area because when you live in the city it's like right nature that I've thing heard about it yeah i drive 40 minutes to go and walk around in the woods and go oh, isn't it so lovely <laughs> you know it's uh so mm. yeah maybe buying a, a, a house out in the middle of the forest and living in a commune is what i took away from this book I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big life change. <laughs> that's a good... It would be, you yeah. get a quote on the front being like, Levi Hildebrand made me move to the woods. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would be the quote. Seriously. It. It's good. Because you've been yeah. viewing lots and stuff, haven't you? Like... Oh, my God. Uh, it might be yeah. happening. I don't know. How do you find it? Because I, in Canada, a big chunk of people actually live in the woods like because we have a lot mm. of woods and that's yeah. a, a luxury that we have but in the uk like most people i would say live in urban areas yes it's rather crowded here i have to say <laughs> we just compared to the landmass but yeah i think it made it made me think actually that of it like i don't live um on occupied land or like stolen land in inverted commas although i guess we all do at some point and also britain's like number one evil guy for going and stealing everybody else's land. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not yeah. like I live on a place that's, that's guiltless. But it's interesting as somebody who doesn't live on quote unquote indigenous land. And I guess I, like when she talks about how everybody is indigenous somewhere. And I guess this is my indigenous land. And, and when I think about the stuff that she's talking about with her plants, I'm like, that's very interesting, Robin. But I don't have that kind of climate or those plants. So I'm not sure how valuable mm. it is for me to read about these ones over the ones that are actually on in my soil and in my climate, which is incredibly moist and rainy and gray. Um, mm. So it made me think about like, I didn't really learn that much about the Celtic Britons, the B-R-I-T-O-N, -R which yeah. it's like the kind of people that lived here from like the Iron Age onwards. And I wonder like when she was describing the huts that indig her indigenous people lived on, they look, they sounded exactly like Saxon or, or Celtic huts, like circular ones that, you know, mimic bushes and like, like all of that. I was yeah. like, I feel like a lot of indigenous cultures learnt from nature and that's why so much of it is actually very very recognizable and similar depending on where you are in the world so i thought that was really interesting and i i actually know don't know anything about um being a druid and like the the like kind of like indigenous wisdom of my own land so maybe mm. i should do some more homework whoa that's what it made me think <laughs> that is wild so i'm becoming a druid and you're moving to the woods <laughs> End of Sorted. story. That is it. Robin, you've done your work. <laughs> wow. Our YouTube channels are going in a very different direction. I know. Well, <laughs> my need is sprucing up anyway, so I think this is the time to pivot. <laughs>
But thank you so much, Levi, for chatting to me about this bloody brilliant book. So if you haven't watched Levi's channel, it is right here. You should click on it right now and watch. Um, it's incredible and you'll learn lots and lots of stuff. And we all like learning, don't we? You don't even mm -hmm. have to pick up a book to learn. Next episode, we are going to be reading this book with this person because I will have planned it by then. <laughs> you can see it on screen. <laughs> Time um, travel. Um, amazing. And if you want to watch any more videos in the series, you can see those here. Thank you so much for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Frog snog out. <laughs>